Good evening, candidates, and good evening to our audience. Uh, this is the Ward 3 Forum for the City Council election we're going to have on November 7. And I'd like to start out by um, uh, uh, thanking our three who are here for uh, taking the time to fill out the questionnaire that St. Paul Strong, who is sponsoring tonight's debate, put forward. Uh, there is one candidate who is not here tonight, I believe, that uh, uh, we're missing in uh, uh, Sarah Jost, or uh, I think that's how I pronounce her name, but you know what, folks? She didn't get the chance tonight, so I hope you appreciate that these folks did want to respond and are here tonight and uh, listen to what they have to say. So uh, I'm Andy Dawkins. I was a state representative for uh, 15 years at the Capitol, representing the Frogtown and Rondo neighborhoods. I uh, ran for mayor uh, unsuccessfully in 1993. And my co-moderator? Hi, my name is Abu Naim. I'm a former um, Ward 1 city council candidate and I'm currently a board member of the Hamlin Midway Coalition. I'd like to thank SPNN for sponsoring this, and uh, I want to talk about St. Paul Strong, who we are. Uh, we're, we believe as a group of uh, uh, just volunteers that come together that uh, government, city government should be transparent, and those that work in city government should be accountable. And that's what we do. We're not partisan. We don't pick candidates. We don't make choices about uh, who should be the winner of any election. Um, we're not going to have opening statements tonight, uh, and we're going to alternate who gets the first question and then go to the, uh, the second question. We'll start with someone else. Uh, there will be a one-minute close at the end, um, and I'll let everybody know when we're getting close to the closing time. First question is going to go to Mr. Barksdale. So, Mr. Barksdale, you just knocked on my door. You've got 20 seconds to tell me why I should vote for you. The reason that you should vote for me is I provide nonpartisan representation as well as a flexible ability to provide solution making, but a ferocious resolve to get the job done. Thank you. Uh, and Mr. Russell. I believe you should vote for me because I have the experience necessary to deal with the difficult policy decisions, discussions that we're going to have. I'm used to building bridges and I take a pragmatic, practical, common sense approach to city government and honestly, try to be the adult in the room. Ms. Hartman. I think you should vote for me because I've been living in this community and connected to the people who live here for more than 40 years. I've been paying attention to what's going on in our city, watching it for more than 40 years. And I'm somebody who's developed some skills of analysis, research, investigation, and I'd like to put them to work for the city. Thanks. Mr. Russell, question two. Uh, you're out visiting relatives in rural Minnesota and your uncle asked you, why do you like living in St. Paul? So what I would tell my uncle, um, which actually I just tell my, my wife's family, in-laws of in Walker, Minnesota, the reason I like living in, in St. Paul is because St. Paul has a rich history. And for me, St. Paul represents so much of what my family came to be. When my father's family came here from Omaha, Nebraska, they really had a dream that they would go to a place that would be somewhere that they could set down their roots. What I love about St. Paul is that it has diversity, is that it has different people here that bring so much to the community, regardless of where they're at in the city. They have their own unique contributions that I think really brings us together and can make us stronger, provided we're willing to listen to a lot of different folks. I love living in St. Paul. It's the reason I set down roots here after having a lot of displacement in my childhood, 35 places by the time I was 15. Um, and a lot of it was because of, of housing insecurity. To me, St. Paul is a great place to raise your children, and that's, you know, I, I just think that we have a future that I believe in. Ms. Hartman. I like St. Paul because it's small. You can get to know your neighbors. They're friendly, they're open, they're generous. We're close to a lot of amenities a few minutes from either downtown area. The city has been for a really long time a very safe place to be, at least most of the time that I've lived here, and a very welcoming city, a city that I would feel very comfortable moving around in and feel like I had access to great health care, schooling, uh, shops, just a few minutes away. Mr. Barksdale. St. Paul is the future, which is why I came here. I am wrapping up my last semester at McAllister College, and I thoroughly enjoy a city that has strong emphasis on academia, a rich history in industrial production, as well as the foundation to be a node of 
political nonpartisanship moving forward in uh, our new day and age. I believe that this city is a walkable city and one that has the proper foundation to be one of the next great American cities. Thank you. Uh, starting with Ms. Hartman, what is the least favorite thing living in St. Paul? Well, these days, my least favorite thing is a slight sense of insecurity about the safety of the city and a growing sense that it's becoming more and more difficult to just be able to move around the city. Uh, a lot of congestion takes a long time to get from one place to another. Uh, it's become somewhat less livable and sadly, a number of shops business places and stores that I used to frequent have just disappeared. Thank you. Mr. Russell, Mr. Braxton. Thank you. Um, one of my least favorite things about St. Paul, unfortunately, is how disconnected certain communities um, feel from each other. There is a, a many multitude of different groups of people who live here in the city and although everybody is looking for a better tomorrow for St. Paul, um, there is a myriad of lenses um, that come with that. And as a result of that, people aren't seeing eye to eye. Um, people are lacking, in my opinion, some compassion for the neighbors not seen, as I like to put it. Um, and I would hope that in this election, uh, people in the ward and people in the St. Paul community as a whole can take the time uh, to rectify this. Mr. Russell. So I would say uh, the least favorite thing is I feel is a lack of attention or a lack of focus on the very basic things that we rely on from local government. And this crosses a myriad of things that I believe we absolutely have to get right. Public safety is absolutely one of them, but so is economic development. So is making sure that we have strong services. So is building our infrastructure. The very basic things that I think a capital city needs to be the best city that it can be, it's something that I'm very concerned that has not been the focus uh, of policymakers. And really, to me, that is something that is a great opportunity for people to come together around some shared vision. Every community wants to be safe. Everyone does better when we develop our economy. Everyone wants to have equitable services regardless of what you look like and where you live. So to me is that lack of focus on the very basic things we need from local government. Thank you. Uh, next question, I think we start with uh, Mr. Barksdale. Um, tell me and my co-moderator, Mr. Naeem, something uh, that lets us know that you get it in your gut about what racism is. I am someone that will always speak out against authoritative abuses. Um, I recognize that racism is a product of a system, that ignorance is bred in the absence of education. I am one that is able to recognize that when seemingly progressive authorities declare that they are helping out minorities, that they are unintentionally hurting them when they fall short on their promises. And as a specific example, in the case of two settlements that we have had this year regarding young black men, little older than I am, who were murdered by the police, I always make sure that I am speaking with a firm and uncompromising voice when it comes to making sure that we have a safer day for both the people and potential victims of racism as a part of a system, as well as those who are in the system that fall victim to it. Thank you. Mr. Russell. So the, the easy solution would be to say when someone calls you a name or when someone treats you different, regardless of the fact that you are carrying yourself in the way that you would expect every single neighbor to be, to, to conduct themselves. But really is, as I take a systemic approach, you know, 
working on racial equity is something that I do for a living at the Center for Economic Inclusion. And to me, how I know that I get it in, in there, my gut is when I look at my background, the ability for me to be where I'm at was so much, so much of it is dedicated to the fact that I was able to have a white grandfather who worked very hard, absolutely worked very hard, but he came from World War II, took his GI Bill, went to Michigan State, became, as he said, a disc jockey, never called it a DJ, and he was able to build a good life for my mom that paid dividends for me when I was homeless and I needed a place to be. But when I talk to my father, and my father tells me of what they call the Night Riders, which was the Klan that came to him in Omaha, Nebraska, the stories that he tells me are very different is when I look at history and I know that a lot of GIs returning from World War II that were people of color could not get into a lot of white universities and HBCUs were full. That lack of opportunity and how it's manifested itself in my life. I am very lucky to have the grandparents that I did, worked incredibly hard, helped set the foundation, a stable community, a stable household for me to work hard. But that story right there, to me, that's how I know that racism is real. Thank you, Ms. Hartman. I think racism manifests itself in a lot of more subtle ways. Obviously, we've heard some remarks here that describe some very extreme examples of violence and fatal outcomes that are very sad, very tragic, and that's a part of what can be a racist culture. But I think you see a lot of things every day. People who don't want to make eye contact with somebody, people who don't want to acknowledge somebody who comes from a different ethnic background, people who just simply don't feel comfortable. And you can tell that in a lot of subtle ways. Uh, that's what, it, and then there can also be the patronizing that goes on. I think that's another thing we have to be aware of. I think, um, if I were a member of other races and I listen to some of the comments that you hear, even in forums like this, I think I might find it offensive that there's a somewhat of a implication right in so many of these comments that there's something lesser about these races and that there's something that they can't solve um, with their own resources. And that's not to say that we aren't there to be compassionate and extend a hand. Sometimes there's a way of implying that somebody's blessed by the way in which you extend your hand. That says to me racism in another way. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, starting with uh, Mr. Russell, tell me and Andy something that shows deep understanding of poverty and, and inequity. Um, I, I went from homeless to homeowner, two generations, right? The first homeowner in two generations. I mean, deep uh, understanding of this is the fact that I was able to seize opportunity that was provided for me and claw my way out of the situation I was in. I've made mention about where I was and uh, who I am and everything that I've experienced, that culmination is incredibly important to me. So deep understanding of this, oftentimes when people are in situations in which they're low income, they have a lack of resources, small things that are challenges and are just kind of mere annoyances for, for instance, at the income level I'm at now are significant challenges that they have. I still have family members that deal with this every single day. And that inequality that I see is disproportionately for people that look like me. What it took, the resources it took to get me to where I was going, that's how I have, this under, that's how I have the understanding. It is not easy to claw your way out of being homeless. It is not easy to look around at a roach infested hotel that you're living in and think that there's gonna be a better future. But what it takes is great determination, and it also takes someone extending that open hand that you mentioned, but doing it in a very real and substantive way that actually humanizes you as a person, and not only attempts to pull you up, but cheers you as you do. Ms. Hartman. I think signs that I see of people who are suffering financially have to do with people who are denying themselves what we would think are basics that they probably at one time were able to have. People that tell me, you know, they can't, they can't afford to go out and have a meal because they don't have that money or they need that $10 for something else. Uh, I, I see people who are living on fixed incomes and um, they're, they're not able to get around. 
they don't have a car or the car doesn't run. They're putting up with um, really probably a poor living condition, poor diet, uh, inability to connect with people and do things that are meaningful. And uh, there's a lot of isolation and sadness there. Thank you. Mr. Berksdale. My grandmother, my grandfather on my mother's side, my grandfather on my father's side, these are folks that grew up poor. My folks grew up poor, my mother and father. And I very fortunately was able to grow up with privilege, a privilege provided to me by the previous generations striving to make a better tomorrow for their children. And that hasn't been the case for some of my cousins. I have a cousin of mine, Josiah, who's my exact same age, and yet he does not live with the privileges that I do. He, as the eldest in his family, has to provide for his family, for his younger siblings, for his mother. He had to get a job almost immediately out of high school and certainly had to work while he was still getting his degree done. He needed to have vocational education so that he could pursue a trade that would make him money immediately so that he could provide for his family. My understanding comes from my lack of experience, yet the vision in seeing what poverty has done to my family and where my family still lies in some cases. I will never, to people who live in poverty, pretend as though I truly, bodily, spiritually understand their struggle. But I do have the empathy due to having experienced what some of my other family members have been through. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Russell? Question? No. Is oh, it? Okay, no. We so, already did it all? Yeah. yeah. Oh, Ms. Hartman. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, you guys. Uh, I, my fault. All right, Ms. Hartman, so uh, what was the last volunteer activity you engaged in? Well, there's been quite a few of them. Last uh, one. The very last one, if you're not counting this campaign, uh, I would say being a, on the board of directors for McAllister Groveland Community Council. Also, I'm a volunteer for the Board of Directors for the Neighborhood Network for Seniors. And I was just at a meeting the other night for that. Thank you. Mr. Brexit. So last time I volunteered my time would be associated with uh, a program that I was a part of with the football team at McAllister. There is uh, a family who um, one of the sons has uh, Chiari, um, a form of cancer. And uh, having spent time with him, um, the last time I spent some time with him was um, earlier in this year. I can't exactly remember the date, but um, earlier in this year, I went over and just spent some time hanging out with the brothers and uh, playing games and making him feel as loved as possible. Um, and while that's not something that is super broad in the community, um, I know that Caleb uh, really valued the time that I spent with him. Mm -hmm. Mr. Russell. So volunteering is one of the things that I absolutely love to do. And, um, you know, when this campaign is completed, is I honestly can't wait to getting back to that. So I was on the uh, executive board of the Highland District Council uh, and subsequently had, had to uh, resign uh, for running. But my wife is very much a part of their community uh, engagement committee. And she was volunteering at a... Um, at a uh, Halloween party up at the Highland uh, Rec Center. And so I finished a campaign event and I'm like, hey, I gotta get up there because I can go volunteer. So went up there and honestly, it was one of the fun things to do is trying to make sure that the kids who were getting s'mores um, weren't going back for the third or fourth, that the other kids could, could actually get some. But really it, it was, that's, that's was a fantastic experience. I just got to take campaign, put it over here and, and just hang out with neighbors. Thank you. Uh, starting with um, Mr. Barksdale, who has been a role model for you? 
my father, my grandfather are the first two people that come to mind. Um, I consider myself as a part of a proud lineage of uh, black intellectuals. My, my grandfather worked at IBM for many years um, and my father is uh, currently working at Bose. He's been there for uh, the last five decades, um, dating back to the 80s. And um, those two men have greatly guided me, um, have been the role models that I've needed, and I couldn't possibly have asked for a better father and a better grandfather. Mr. Russell. So, you know, first I'm, I'm heartened to hear the, the positive black men that you had in your life because that is absolutely something that is needed within the black community is making sure that young black youth have role models, people that they can look up to. Absolutely essential. Um, but you know, just one of the interesting things is that one of the biggest role models that loomed for me was when I was playing high school football and of all people, it was a white guy who was conservative from Texas, who was my defensive football coach. So as you can understand, football was very serious for him. But you know, what he taught me was a few important things that I actually remember to this day. And one of them was, it's not about the hard work that you do when I'm looking. It's about the hard work you do when I'm not looking. And as he said, I'll, I'll know you're not doing it, or I know if you will, because the results are what has to be there. And you know, when I, when I came uh, to play football, and he was my coach my sophomore year, you know, I had been in a predominantly people of color, so black people, a lot of, uh, a lot of immigrants from Central and South America. And it was a bit of a culture shock, predominantly white school. And I wanted to quit football. I wanted to quit. But you know, conservative white male from Texas, listening to all the country music in the world saw that. And he said to me, you know, Isaac, if you're experiencing grief, if someone's giving you a hard time because of what you are and what you look like, you come to me and you let me know. That was huge for me. He held me accountable. I was upset because I was being substituted out of a football game. He called me in and I tried to plead my case and he stopped me right there and he says, you have a commitment to this team that you made that's greater than what it is that you're doing. And if you can't be a part of that commitment, then you can't be a part of this team. I'll see you at practice. Mm. That has stuck with me. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Mark Bragger, thank you. Mm. Ms. Herbin. As I was thinking about this, I realized I've had probably three role models. I had a teacher in grade school who, even though it was a Catholic school and we had a number of nuns, religious, teaching there, the teacher that made the biggest impression on me was a lay person, a married woman whose children were all adults, and she had to have been perhaps the most spiritual person, spiritually evolved person I think I'd ever met, though I wouldn't have known how to conceptualize it at that age. Uh, just an extremely loving person, great teacher, the kind of teacher that would pick out the kid in class that was having the worst time at all of all to assimilate, make friends, take that kid under her wing and make sure that she gave him special attention. She was just a fabulous teacher. And in high school, I think it, it transferred to another teacher, my Latin teacher, um, just a very quiet, unassuming, uh, never trying to be the star of, of anything, behind the scenes, getting the work done. And once I became an attorney, um, there wasn't one attorney in particular that I met on some national litigation, wasn't even from Minnesota, an extremely good mentor. And I just felt very grateful for all of the guidance and all of the advice because lawyers can be very competitive and very cutthroat, and this was somebody who just wanted lawyers to succeed and was a fabulous lawyer. Thanks, so I think Mr. Russell, you're gonna be going next on this one. Um, and I want to know from each of you in turn, uh, how you're advantaging ranked choice voting in this election. And let me preface that question by uh, in including, um, St. Paul seems to be a one party town. Mm -hmm. And is that a problem? And so let's just, uh, it's a, kind of two questions in one, but go ahead, Mr. Russell. So 
That $64,000 question, you have a single party town and you have ranked choice voting. The ranked choice voting absolutely encourages folks to go speak with those who may have their first choice with the idea that you're going to be the second choice, which is absolutely something that we're doing, right? It's, hey, this is how we have these connections. It furthers those conversations. So really, it's just not shutting the door when someone has made up their mind. And what I've noticed is that there's people who may say, well, you know, I'm going to stick with my pick. I may not rank you, but you know what? You're at least having a conversation that engenders a better feeling because if either one of us, any one of us wins, then we would have had those conversations and otherwise could have possibly just left it as, oh, you're on the other side. And in a one party town, that's, that's gonna be half the thing that we resolve. The attempt to resolve city elections in April when everyone hasn't even begun to pay attention till mid-September. We have party processes and I'm someone that absolutely worked for Senate Democrats for nine years. But that is absolutely something that we're gonna to have to resolve because there has to be diversity of opinion and diversity of thought. And when we have it to a narrow select group of people, that is not the diversity of thought that we need to have. So to me, quite frankly, is I think all folks should continue on to the general, have those necessary debates, especially in a nonpartisan election in which we're supposed to be talking about ideas and not loyalty. Thank you. Ms. Hartman. Yeah, I think the ranked choice system is good in certain respects. It's going to open it up, and you don't have to be somebody who got to the finish line and had to be uh, so affiliated with a party that you couldn't compete for the office. I like that. And it does invite conversations amongst the candidates and between the candidates, and you don't have to look at people as being uh, adverse to you necessarily. Uh, but at the same time, uh, there can be some issues here. I think um, people can sometimes uh, appreciate that a one-party town is lacking in that tension, uh, the healthy debate, the different voices, uh, the willingness to say there has to be another side of the question. And it seems like we've got a lot of narratives going that are so similar that people are, and, and I think people are afraid to challenge them. They're, they're afraid to say they have a different idea because there seems to be one predominant narrative on a lot of these issues. Thank you. Mr. Braxdale. So what I've found going door to door is people are certainly looking for options and are keenly aware that we have been a one party town. Um, but you go door to door and you announce your candidacy and people sort of recalibrate and say, oh, that is refreshing that we have candidates that aren't beholden to party politics. Um, I really enjoy ranked choice voting. I do not have the financial bandwidth to otherwise compete with Isaac or Patty or Sora because uh, I'm a student. And uh, I simply don't have the bandwidth to raise the funds that they have. Um, I've been to plenty of doors and houses uh, that have signs for my opponents out in front of them. Um, and yet, uh, due to our ranked choice vote, um, people are more than willing to not only consider me for their second vote, but certainly consider me for their first as well. Um, and so I'm quite encouraged by our ranked choice voting, and I'm also encouraged by the dialogue that I've been hearing door to door because I know that people are desiring nonpartisanship. So it's not so to be a commentary by me on this, but I just want to say to uh, the viewers here that uh, uh, the one candidate not here, Ms. Jost, Jost, uh, whatever, um, is she hiding behind her DFL label that she thinks that's just enough? I'm really encouraging voters to pay attention to ranked choice voting. If it so happens that she doesn't get 50% plus one on the first count through, you're going to have a chance to also vote for one of these who may very well be your next city council member. I'm sorry, but I needed to say that. Thank you very much, Mr. So, Ms. Hartman, this is uh, starting with you. Is your neighborhood safe, and what makes a safe neighborhood? I want to think my neighborhood is safe. Uh, and I tell myself it is, uh, but I do hear stories from neighbors 
about uh, break-ins, catalytic converter theft, stolen cars, uh, and general concerns about um, carjackings or maybe something that could be more violent. Um, so I know my experience thus far personally doesn't exactly mirror everybody in my neighborhood. But what makes a neighborhood safe? I know that years ago, uh, McAllister Groveland was thought to be one of the safest neighborhoods in the whole seven county metro area. And I know the explanation given was that there were a high percentage of retired people that were home during the day keeping an eye on things. And so I have to say I've, I've never found that it to be an irrational explanation. Having people around, people there, so that it doesn't feel like a ghost town, I think that filling it up with people and humanity uh, helps you to feel safe. Mark Dale. So in terms of thinking about how safe the neighborhood is, um, Immediately, I was drawn to an experience that I had in another neighborhood, another part of the city. When I was in Frogtown um, a handful of years ago, this is about three years ago, I almost got caught up in a drive-by. Um, and there were a group of young men who were literally crossing the street 40 feet in front of me, and a car wheeled around and started shooting at them. Um, and I was very fortunate not to get caught up. Um, and ever since I've been looking over my shoulder whenever I'm walking around at night. Um, that was in a different part of the city and not something that I have even come close to experiencing in Matt Groveland, but that doesn't mean uh, that uh, the area that we're in, Matt Groveland and Highland Park, um, are you know any more safe by that metric. I as a college student, um, am aware of some of my peers who have been susceptible to break-ins, um, both in their homes and in uh, the dorms. And so um, I recognize that theft is something that happens in all parts of the city and that uh, crime and safety concerns are something that happens in all parts of the city. Um, it's just a matter for me of what type of scale they're happening and how violent they are, um, because that really indicates how I may approach safety concerns. Mr. Russell. So how do I, like, do I feel safe in, in, in my neighborhood? Uh, and the answer is yes, but I also have to be cognizant of something. I'm a six foot one guy, right? How I show up in physical space is different than someone who, for instance, across the street has lived there for 50 years and is, is elderly. It's different than even my wife, who is 5'4 and, and half my size. So I have to be cognizant about how I engage in my environment, right, and, and knowing how I show up. What makes a neighborhood safe, though, are the connections between neighbors. It's looking out for each other. It's knowing who you can go to that can help you out. It's having those sinews of contact, phone numbers, emails, those things in which you can alert people to what's going on. And there is an absolute example right behind me where I live. So for the folks who are in my neighborhood, Alaska Street, there was a problem house that was there. For multiple years, there had been significant drug deals that had been going out of, out of the home, people who had been getting shot. There was even a murder there. What changed it, what made it more safe was the persistent and consistent and determined advocacy on behalf of the neighborhood, working with law enforcement, working with the local council member, working with anyone who would be willing to help them in their goal of getting the folks who are there out of the neighborhood, right? Which thankfully happened. The home was, there was a forced sale that was on the home and now there's a new set of people who have moved in there and has significantly contributed to, to the safety in the neighborhood. That is something that I want to repeat across the city to make sure that we're building those sinews of trust between communities that typically don't have that and our law enforcement, but that's what it takes. It takes a strong community working in tandem with law enforcement that has the resources that are necessary. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Hartman. The question about- Yeah, do now I it's your turn. I started. She started. Oh gosh, here yeah. I go again. All right, so next question. Now, um, 
this Mr. Barksdale's turn to go first. This is a, a rather nuanced question, so I want you to listen carefully to it. Um, it goes like this. How will you work to reconcile the reality that in different parts of the, uh, parts of the city, uh, people have had different lived experiences with regards to public safety? How will you work for solutions that are citywide, inclusive, and reflect the multiple lived experiences? Thank you for the question. First and foremost, and I alluded to this earlier when talking about racism, um, I believe that accountability goes a long way when uh, looking to cultivate uh, communal trust. Um, when there are authoritative abuses and uh, a cop uh, either harms a resident or kills a resident, um, and the city doubles down on not placing any blame uh, at the feet of the police or a given officer, um, community is not going to trust law enforcement, or the city for that matter. And so uh, admitting when you make mistakes is the least that the city can do. Beyond that, um, in terms of having a holistic approach, I have been talking uh, consistently on the campaign trail about reallocations. And I wanna be very, very clear. Uh, when I say reallocations, I'm not explicitly saying defund the police. I'm saying that within the police budget, there are some item expenditures that I think can be reallocated for a more equitable force and service. I see that we are spending close to $55 million annually on police patrolling as opposed to uh, a couple hundred thousand dollars on uh, juvenile and criminal mental health. I see that our budget on patrolling is two and a half times the budget that we have for major crimes and investigation. Having reallocations, not only would it enable us to have a more effective police force, but I truly believe uh, will take away some strain that there exists between our force and certain communities who have experienced those adverse abuses. Thank you. Mr. Russell. So I think the first thing to do here is recognize shared humanity. Understanding that so many people have different experiences with law enforcement. And it's not dismissing them outright and out of hand. But when we talk about that shared humanity, that idea that everyone wants to be safe. Everyone wants to know their children have a safe community, have safe schools, that we have businesses that are safe, that our neighborhoods are safe. From there, as we come together and try to find a set of shared principles. I'm someone that does believe in fully funding our law enforcement. And as part of that, we need a full spectrum of law enforcement public safety resources that are made available. So in terms of public safety, I do believe that we need to make sure that we're paying our officers overtime for the amount of work that they're putting in there. I absolutely believe that we need to make sure that we have the detective force to solve our non-fatal shootings. We need partnership with our Metro Transit to make sure that the public safety issues that we're seeing on commuter rail is something that is absolutely addressed. But I also believe, and coming from the background that I have, that those upstream solutions are things that we also have to work on. Opportunities for youth programming, job internships, these sorts of things that give youth something to do because unfortunately within the past few years we have seen that a lot of the, the, the increases in crime were driven unfortunately by youth and they need something to do. We can't arrest our way out of our public safety challenges, but we do when we arrest people have to hold folks accountable, but when we're part of holding them accountable means that we are giving them opportunities to break the cycles of going back into the same environments, exposed to the same things that will help them create the same challenges. So to me, in order to be safe, in order to do this right, we have to have a full spectrum. We don't rob Peter to pay Paul. If these are both our priorities, funding opportunities, and then making sure we're funding our law enforcement, we find the money to do both, and we do it properly in partnership with law enforcement agencies across the metro area. Ms. Hartman. 
I'm wondering, could you repeat the question? Well, yeah, it's a long one. So I'm just going to uh, say, hey, all around our city, people have different lived experiences with public safety, right? So if you're on the city council, you got to come with something that's pretty citywide inclusive of all the different neighborhoods about how we deal with public safety. What are you going to do? I think I'd like to meet with uh, police officers that patrol the various neighborhoods, maybe even go on a ride along. Um, I did that a few years ago. It was an eye-opening experience. It was in mostly in uh, Ward 3, maybe a little Ward 4, but I do know that there are more gunshots, more violence in other neighborhoods outside of Ward 3, so that would be a different experience. I think that... Um, there's a lot of information that's available these days as the police have had to wear cameras, audio, video recordings. There's a lot of technology that's a fairly objective um, depiction of what they confront. And I think it would be helpful for all of us in a community to understand the different circumstances that the police will encounter in the various neighborhoods. And some of them are really fraught with a lot of dangers. So I think if I wanted to educate myself about the different approaches and the different senses of public safety issues in the various neighborhoods or around the city, I would try to investigate some of the things that are common to different, to different neighborhoods because I know there are trends and there are um, examples of things that you'll find more common on the east side of St. Paul, for example, as opposed to Ward 3. Thank you. Uh, starting with Mr. Russell, uh, what have you done personally to curb gun violence, and what will you do once elected? So I am a member of Moms Demand Action. Uh, it's Moms and Others, right? So it's just the clarification right there. Um, and we obviously do a lot around uh, gun violence education, making sure that people understand the dangers of, of not storing your weapons properly, but also looking for solutions for when gun violence is at play in the community. So currently right now, I'm the chair of the Neighborhood Safety Community Council, one of the many councils to the city um, of, of residents appointed uh, by Mayor Carter. And our goal is to provide public safety recommendations uh, to him. One of the things that we're working on right now is gun violence prevention. Without giving too much away, because we haven't uh, announced the awarding of grants, we are looking to partner with nonprofits, organizations that are looking to provide some sort of educational component to gun violence prevention. We're looking at possible partnership with local schools, and this is an absolute volunteer thing. So that is absolutely something that I do. I volunteer with Moms Demand Action for, for having booths. I testified uh, downtown uh, in favor of, of the safe gun uh, ordinance storage, told the, the story about uh, how gun violence uh, has affected some of my family members. So um, that is work that I would love to continue uh, as a council member representing Ward 3. Thank you. Ms. Harmer. I don't have any personal involvement with guns, and uh, I don't belong to any groups, any uh, gun clubs or anything else where people are going to acquire them. But I think one of the things that you could do to combat the individual desire to own guns is to help create a better sense of public safety with the law enforcement system that we do have. I think part of the reason some people resort to ownership of guns is a sense of a need for vigilantism because they don't feel safe. Um, I know there are a lot of illegally owned guns floating around out there. I would hope that we could enforce the laws where if people are in possession illegally, that we can do something to enforce the, the laws that should have kept them from getting them. Um, other than helping people have a safer sense in their own community so they wouldn't be tempted to own their own guns, I think that would be probably the main thing I can think of. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Brexdale. So I've been a part of a, a few conversations on campus during my time at McAllister. Um, I'm not officially affiliated with any um, advocacy groups. When thinking about uh, gun issues in our state, or sorry, in our uh, city, um, and I suppose in our state and in our country on the whole, um, I, I certainly consider some of the components that uh, my opponents have uh, previously mentioned in their statements. I absolutely believe that we need to uh, partner with groups to provide education. Um, and then certainly addressing uh, illegal firearms and vigil, vigil anteism in our community is paramount. 
Um, I think that when considering these resolutions, it is paramount to remember that a lot of the vigil antiism we are seeing uh, is within communities where illegal firearms are happening or are, are possessed, where uh, crimes are happening frequently. These are areas that need uh, more systemic answers than just how do we make sure that people uh, don't get those guns. Because if you provide educational opportunities um, for a group of folks who uh, all, are already um, outside of the realm of education, it's going to, the message is not going to be received by the target audience. Um, and so not only does it have to be educational within schools, uh, but there needs to be a deeply seated communal conversation uh, where mothers and fathers, where aunts and uncles, sisters and brothers are able to deeply get into the connections of uh, potential vigilantes in our city and say to them uh, that their perpetuation of violence uh, is cyclical. Mr. Russell. Can we repeat the question again? Go ahead. Go ahead, yours. Wait, wait, no. Sorry. Yeah, we're, gonna, we're asking yeah. about what have you uh, done personally to deal with gun violence? Yeah, yeah he started. Oh, yeah, yeah, cow, yeah. I, I go again. <laughs> Ms. Hartman, so um, we have an issue in uh, the Highland Park neighborhood that I understand that is uh, that uh, average affordable housing, single family houses are being torn down for McMansions to build bigger houses, more expensive houses. What are we going to do about that? Well, I think that it's good for the community to be able to provide choice and options in housing. And I don't want to say that there should be a legal limit to anybody's house. I would not personally choose a McMansion, but I don't want to deny somebody else the right to have that if that's what they want and, and that's something that they can obtain. Um, I don't have a problem uh, saying that there can be large houses, small houses, various kinds of housing. In fact, I think that the community is better off for having those kinds of choices because they allow people to have different kinds of lifestyles. And that's what will keep the community vibrant. Um, I, I, I don't see that as a problem. If you're talking about um, the kind of house that now starts to eat into the airspace and the sunlight and totally overshadow the neighbors, I can understand the consternation there. And I think that's something that's a zoning issue. And I think that as long as housing is compatible with its surroundings, we should support that. And as long as there's a demand for it, we should support that. Um, I would hate to see everything turn into the same cookie cutter type of housing that seems to be predominantly constructed these days. Mr. Barksdale. Thank you. Um, so th when thinking about this issue, uh, I, I, the lens for me has to be beyond Ward 3. Um, and I have, on the campaign trail, been talking about um, rehabilitating vacancies as a means of uh, increasing our supply of single family homes, <coughs> one, and two, as a means of preventing uh, vacancies from being bought up and turned into those McMansions. That isn't uh, specific, I suppose, to um, occupied single-family homes. Um, but when thinking about uh, vulnerable communities, communities vulnerable to gentrification, um, not only do we have to provide uh, affordable starter homes for people to jump from the rental market into the owner-occupied market, um, but we, like I said, need to prevent against uh, the purchase and development of McMansions in areas where they may otherwise uh, jack up the uh, valuation of the neighborhood and thus the property taxes beyond the means of those who already live there. Mm -hmm. Mr. Russell. So my concern, you know, about the McMansions, and I, and I do respect the fact that people do have the right to do as they will 
with their property as you know property rights to allow. But the the concern that I have about McMansions is that overbuilding something that really can come off as honestly a monstrosity that is the not not the right sized housing uh, for for neighborhoods. And what that does in terms of the, the, the property valuations and how that deters new people from being able to afford to move in, especially in a city that is already struggling to add housing because of our rent control policy. So that is something that is a concern for me, making sure that people are, are honoring the, the requirements to build. Right, so if they're asking for variances, making sure that, that they're proving that these are necessary variances so that they're not overbuilding on lots. Making sure that they're maintaining and honoring the setbacks that are required and that we're just not adding carte blanche uh, exceptions, variances for, for setbacks. I do understand that people can afford different types of housing, but I think one of the things that's endearing about St. Paul is the fact that we have a lot of old homes around. My house was built in 1947, that's history. The house right next to me, built in the same era, looks way different. To me, that sort of character is, is worth preserving. So honoring the fact that people have property rights, I do think that there has to be a balance because I do not want to see so many of these homes torn down. Thank you. We're getting near the end of our hour. Uh, we'll be getting the closes in just a minute and we'll be starting at the end with Ms. Hartman on the one minute close. But two things first, uh, to the audience again, please go look at the questionnaires that these folks have taken the time to fill out. There's so many things we haven't been able to get to. Do they support rent control? Are they in favor of the Summit Avenue bikeway? There's, are they gonna vote yes or no uh, on the one cent sales tax increase that we got coming up on November 7th? These are very important issues. Please educate yourself on what uh, these folks think about. And remember, there's someone who didn't even want to give any answers, okay? So now, um, uh, uh, I'm gonna add, 30 seconds to everybody's close because there's one question I really want to get to, um, and it's a tough one, but just do 30 seconds with it, okay? Uh, what do you see as the pros of cons of using tax increment financing, TIF? Start with that and then do your one minute close. I'm sorry, let's do the 30 seconds first. Quickly, I think we're gonna, whose turn is it to go first in the TIF question? Is it, uh, I think it's Mr. Russell, Mr. Barkdale. What do you think about TIF? Um, I myself am not, a huge supporter of TIF when looking at what um, options the city has in terms of economic development. Um, I found just nationally in terms of reviews of how it's been implemented across the country to be reasonably unfavorable. Um, I've also seen we have uh, a similar to TIF program with uh, our STAR program uh, in, in St. Paul that I think has been misappropriated. Um, and so it's something that is an interesting idea, but I'm certainly wary of. Thank you, Mr. Russell. So tax increment financing is something that we have to make sure we're enforcing the if not but for test. There is the assumption oftentimes when it comes to developmental projects that you will automatically get the TIF. TIF is a very flexible tool that when used properly can absolutely help with the development. And it's something that folks, for instance, will have to look at downtown when we're looking at retrofitting incredibly expensive buildings for possible residential. But that does not mean that you can walk in and automatically assume that you're going to get this TIF and deter future tax payments to the city for this. I worked at the state senate. I've seen bad TIFs get rolled over and just watched how that can just bleed money. Thank you. Ms. Hartman. Yeah, I think TIF has been overused and misused in St. Paul. I agree that it's a tool that could be valuable in the right situation where you absolutely need some kind of money like that to jumpstart a project that wouldn't otherwise come into being. But there have been a number of examples in recent years where people question why did we have to give the developer $275 million to develop a parcel of land that most people thought was quite desirable as an opportunity. and. People don't necessarily understand that that money then finds its way back to the developer's pocket and it hollows out the money that we thought were going to go to our, you know, our, our expenses for our city. So, yeah. I'm proud of the three of you for understanding TIF. At the legislature, it took me 15 years to try and get an idea of how it works. So you're very good for answers, all three of you. Now, uh, one minute closes and we start with Ms. Hartman. Well, thank you. Thank you to St. Paul Strong for holding this forum. This is such a great thing to put this on and let the people of St. Paul have a chance to uh, see the candidates in action, thinking on their feet. I really appreciate it. 
I would hope that they could vote for me. I'm somebody who's been here for 40 years. I try to think carefully about the issues. I like to talk to other people. I really like to get lots of sources. I'll, I'm fond of saying I'll steal good ideas from anybody. I don't feel that I have all the ideas, and I'm always looking for another point of view to uh, build a better solution to a problem. And um, I would love to represent Ward 3 at the city. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Brexdale. I believe that I am someone who will be flexible in how I get problems done, but ferocious in making sure that they get done. I am a nonpartisan, not beholden to party politics, and due to my youth, I am someone who is imaginative and creative and not limited and constrained uh, in my ideas about how to execute policy. I recognize that we have four very great candidates up on the ballot and that uh, it's going to be a competitive race. And I certainly encourage everybody listening to look up and understand my policy positions on certain issues as well as the issues that my opponents are taking. Mr. Russell. So you don't know how many times I actually read the House research summary on what TIF. <laughs> so it got me there. But so and I also want to say is um, thank you so much for asking the questions about racial equity and racism. That's something that needs to be discussed. Um, and thank you for just laying that out there. Um, but also just thank you for having me like Patty, Troy. Thank you for, for, for coming. It's fantastic to have candidates come speak to people, you know, this is an important policy related position in which you have to make important policy choices. You're responsible for the intended consequences as much as you are the unintended consequences. And with so many folks leaving the council, there is much experience going out of the door. I have the experience to hit the ground from day one running. Policy is literally what I've been doing for 12 years. I want to bring a pragmatic voice, a pragmatic voice that is willing to look at things and not merely be beholden to those who have political capture based upon having a lot of people in the room. It requires building bridges. It requires speaking to people who you may not agree with. But that's the point of being a policymaker, a public servant. Thank you. Hey, everybody, good job. We're done. <laughs>